So this is going to be a pretty off-the-cuff kind of tutorial uh, where I'm just going to kind of walk you through a very basic system that I made in, in some of my games and I'm sure other people have made very similar uh, systems in their games to uh, represent a very basic snow effect using objects rather than something like um, uh, particle effects. So all we're starting with is a single one by one uh, single pixel, white pixel, to represent our snowflake. And we're just going to use the default room. Uh, obviously it's a black backdrop which is perfect for you know contrast sake. Uh, we'll have the snowflakes drifting down the screen once this is all done. And um, so let's just get started. Um, we're really only going to need two objects for the sake of this tutorial. Uh, I like the naming convention using underscores so that later on if I need to refer to these objects or sprites or anything else in, in the code, I um, have a uniform naming convention to, to know what to look for. So the snowflakes themselves are going to be just multiple instances of a single snowflake, so I'll call it object snowflake. And I'll go ahead and give that our uh, snowflake sprite. And then I'm going to need something that controls the snow. I'll call it uh, OBJ Snow Controller. Makes sense. And um, it, when we add to this later on, this can do a whole lot of stuff. But for the sake of what we're doing today, this is just going to uh, spawn multiple snowflakes. So that's pretty much it in terms of objects. Uh, we've got everything we need. Now we just need to define some events and the logic to those events to make the snow look um, what it's supposed to look like. So for the create event of the snow controller, so when it is uh, created, when it is loaded, uh, this will uh, execute this code a single time upon its creation. So um, I'm just going to do a basic for loop. So for uh, equals zero, I is less than, um, let's say, 200, and I++. Plus plus. And if you don't know much about for loops, um, that's probably some confusing syntax. And of course, you can look up for loops and what they do and, and the purpose of them. Um, in the manual, if you just middle click on this, um, you'll get the documentation for for loop. Um, but at its most basic level, what we're doing here is saying, Okay, um, we want some piece of code which is going to be in between these brackets to run multiple times. So I'm going to set an arbitrary value that I'm calling i to 0. And while that number is less than 200, increment that value by 1. So essentially this uh, loop, whatever I'm going to put in here, is going to run 200 times. So what I'm doing here is spawning a snowflake for each time this loop runs. And I don't want to spawn them all in the same place because that would be very bizarre to have 200 snowflakes all in the same uh, part of our room, say, you know, 200 snowflakes exactly here or exactly here or exactly here. We want them to be all over the place the second that this object is loaded. So how do we go about doing that? We say uh, instance create, and the I think the latest function is depth. I think there used to be just a plain old instance create, but I'm not sure. This was a long time ago I was working with that. But um, we have these four different arguments. So we have x, y, depth, and the object. So we're going to do this 200 times, and we want the object to be at various x and y values all over the screen. So instead of doing anything manually, we'll just use the random function so that every single time this bit of code is run, it will be placed at random uh, x and y values. And I prefer to use the uh, function iRandom because there is both random and iRandom. Um, but iRandom will give you a nice clean whole number, whereas random will give you, uh, uh, I think it's a float value with um, just an absurd amount of decimal points, and I think it's much easier to work with the whole numbers, so I'm going to use iRandom. 
So this is going to be our x value, the first value that we're putting in here, right? We have x, y, depth, and object. So um, to get what we want to accomplish, we basically want to say this value can be anywhere from here to here, the entire width of the room. And while you could measure the width of the room or you could look at the properties of the room to find that out, it'd be much easier just to say, um, for our purposes here today, um, I random <coughs> room width. Because I random will return a value between zero and whatever number you put in here. And this number is the room width. So it will return a value between zero and the total length of the room, which is perfect for what we want to do. So go ahead and uh, give that the ending parenthesis, and we'll move on to y. Now, what we could potentially do is just say uh, y equals zero. And every single snowflake will spawn from the top of the screen and drift down as we uh, fill in the snowflake logic. But that looks kind of weird. Because you can imagine um, if you load the game and um, the snow all starts from the top of the screen, it looks as if whenever you're entering this room, the snow just began to fall. But it'd be a lot more natural to uh, see the snow falling all over the screen as soon as you start. And I can kind of show you what that looks like once we finish off all the logic here. But um, for now, let's just say not only do we want the snowflakes to be distributed on the x-axis, we also want them to be distributed randomly on the y-axis. So that the second this loads, you'll see snowflakes all over the screen instead of just falling up from the top. So let's go ahead and do that. That will look like I random, oop, hang on. Uh, say, um, room height. and closing that off. Depth is an interesting issue. We are not going to worry about it too much right now because um, it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with this very simple tutorial. Uh, if we had all kinds of different objects and we had a foreground and a background and, and player sprites and background sprites and foreground sprites, this would be a much bigger issue. However, um, for today, we're just gonna say one because the only object that's going to be on the screen for this tutorial is going to be the snowflake. So every single snowflake is going to have an equal depth value. So we're not going to have a whole lot of interference um, between the different snowflake objects. They'll just kind of all overlap on the same uh, layer of a depth equal to one. And of course, now we need to tell this bit of code what we want to spawn. We've told it where we want to spawn on the X, where we want it to spawn on the Y, the depth, and now we need the actual object. So the object that we're spawning is the snowflake. So let's go ahead and just save that. So now we've got pretty much the only logic that we're going to use in our snow controller for now. So we're saying as soon as this object is loaded on the create function, um, do this bit of code 200 times. So let's take room zero and drop the snow controller in there. And now when we run this, hopefully if I did everything correctly, we'll have a smattering of snowflakes all over the screen. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Yep, and just like that, um, at random intervals, we have X and Y values all over the place. Uh, all these snowflakes are just spawned completely at random based on the code that we wrote. All right, so now that we've got this object spawning the various snowflakes all over the screen, we need to define what the snowflake object itself is going to do. And since this is going to be spawned 200 times, we want to make sure that each individual instance of the snowflake has a bit of variance to it. And um, one way we can do that is by ensuring that not all the snowflakes fall at the same speed. And we can define a speed, and let's say between one and three, uh, by first declaring a variable, let's just call it fall speed, and make that equal to iRandom, and we'll say two, 
but we can't just leave it at 2 because there's a possibility that irandom will return 0. So if we want this to be between 1 and 3, we'll need to add 1. So that in the worst case scenario, this returns 0, we at least have a minimum speed of 1. So now when we have 200 different snowflakes being uh, spawned all over the screen, it will run this bit of code for each one of those snowflakes. So some snowflakes will have a speed of 1, some will have a speed of 2, some will have a speed of 3. And to make it so that the snowflakes are actually being updated as they go down the screen, so it actually has that illusion of movement, we need to go from create to step. So create obviously only runs when the object is created. That is when this spawns those objects, this will be run under create. And it will only be run once, um, whereas step is going to be run um, for every single frame of the game. So to update where the snowflake is going to go, we need to take its ID, and um, this is a built-in variable, which is just referencing itself. So um, you could also use self, Oop, self. Um, but ID, I believe, is the most up-to-date. Um, and you can take a look at the manual to see what the difference is between self and ID. But in any event, um, ID is just referring to the object Snowflake itself, this particular instance. So we'll say ID dot Y equals the same thing, ID dot Y plus ball speed. So that every single frame of the game, it's taking where it currently is on the y-axis and adding to that whatever this fall speed is. So if we were to just go ahead and save that and run the game again, we should now have different uh, snowflakes falling at different speeds between 1 and 3. Let's take a look and see if that's the case. And that's exactly what we have. Some are falling at a speed of 3, some at a speed of 2, and these last few stragglers here are all falling at a speed of 1. But now they're all gone. They're all off the screen. And we need to fix that. So how can we make sure that when the snowflakes reach the bottom of the screen, they are recycled, they are uh, essentially regenerated? We don't want to keep creating new objects. Um, to have this keep running over and over and over again, uh, to keep creating another 200 snowflakes, it would be a lot more uh, efficient if we just recycled the ones that we already used. So here, we'll say when this snowflake goes outside of the room, that's under other, and go outside room, so beyond the bounds of the room in any direction, here being below the screen, all we're going to do is set the ID Y so this object, its y coordinate, set it to zero. That'll bring it right back to the top of the screen. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay, and now just like we wanted, all the snowflakes, as soon as they're going outside the room, are instantly being brought back up to the same uh, Y position, which is zero. So now we have this illusion that there's this continuous snowfall from somewhere beyond the screen above. And obviously this is kind of a bit boring. Um, it's not dynamic, it's not doing anything. Uh, there's, no, there's no variance in the X coordinates of the snow. Uh, they're all moving in a straight line down which is, of course, not how snow works. There's a lot more drift, depending on the wind. Um, even without so much as a gentle breeze, just uh, the, the resistance, the, I, I don't know, wind resistance of the, s the snowflake as it's falling will cause it to sway this way and that way. So this doesn't really look all that realistic, but it's a good start. And as we uh, kind of move forward, we will add some of those things. Um, to this snow system and we'll get it looking a bit better. But this is um, 
just a rudimentary, very basic snow system using objects. And in the next video, we'll take a look at adding a bit of drift.